Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad you joined us for the first session of our virtual discussion series, Equitable Implementation of Healthy Housing Policies. This series is intended to illustrate how strong housing policies paired with equitable implementation can support and promote health equity through access to affordable, healthy, safe, and stable housing. Each session is each session will include panel style discussions featuring community, local and state leaders, as well as stakeholders who will share examples of innovative policies and implementation strategies, as well as other insights rooted in their experiences. My name is Shanique Wawusu and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Change Lab Solutions. Before I hand it over to my colleague Vince to kick off this discussion today, I wanted to take a moment to welcome you all and briefly introduce Change Lab Solutions. ChangeLab is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that uses the tools of law and policy to advance health equity. We partner with communities across the nation to improve health and opportunity by changing harmful laws, policies, and systems. Our interdisciplinary team works with community organizations, governments, and local institutions to design and implement equitable and practical policy solutions to complex challenges. For more than 20 years, <clears throat> Change Lab has been working alongside communities and local governments to help them create lasting changes that will help all residents live a healthy life. We know many places are working to achieve equitable outcomes and struggle with the how of doing it. At Change Lab, we believe that laws and policies that have perpetuated racism, discrimination, and segregation throughout our nation's history have had and continue to have a profound effect on health and well being. Our work focuses on addressing what we call the fundamental drivers of inequity pictured here. Structural discrimination and racism, income inequality, disparities in opportunity, disparities in political power, and governance that limits meaningful participation are all forces that create inequity and widen existing disparities. We outline this framework in our Blueprint for Changemakers, which is available on our website for anyone interested in a deeper dive. Law and policy have played a large role in creating existing health disparities. However, law and policy can also be used to address these drivers and create long-term positive change. We see equitable enforcement as one way to start leveraging governance to promote health equity. We're kicking off this series with a conversation about policymaking for housing justice focusing on the use of equitable implementation strategies to ensure that housing codes do not have unintended inequitable effects and that the codes do what they are intended to do, protect the health and safety and welfare of occupants. We also hope that you'll join us for upcoming sessions. We've got a great lineup. We will be discussing right to counsel as well as capacity building for equitable implementation. With that, I want to thank you again for being here, and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Vince Young, to get the conversation started. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nikola. Um, I'm Vince Young, and I'm an attorney here at Change App Solutions. And first, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to go over some logistical notes for today. We are recording this event, and it will be posted on the Change Lab Solutions website. And you'll receive an email with the link to the recording once it's ready. If you have any questions for our panelists today, throughout today's discussion, please submit them through the Q&A box. My colleague Greg Niao and I will be monitoring incoming questions, and we'll have some time at the end to address them. The chat function for the webinar is also open, so we invite you to share comments or reactions along the way and to engage with fellow attendees. I also want to let everyone know that a live transcription option is also available for today's session. So in your Zoom window, you should see a button that says live transcript. It's pictured here on the slide. If you click on that, you'll have the option to either show or hide subtitles. You can also adjust, adjust the font size to fit your preferences under subtitle settings. And finally, our, our colleague Bernard Lim is helping us ensure that all the tech runs smoothly today. If you run into any technical issues, you can send them a direct note via Zoom chat. And with that, let's begin. 
So as we all know, housing is an ever salient issue, but particularly, particularly now given record high inflation, significant job losses, wage stagnation, low rates of home construction, and rising rents that all culminate in the current housing affordability crisis. Over 40% of renter households, or 19 million households, are rent burdened, spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Further, about 6 million homes in the United States are considered substandard, presenting health and safety danger to occupants. Housing codes exist to redress some of these issues. However, as with many other laws, there's a significant gap between the promise of our laws and people's lived experiences. This gap exists in part because laws designed to keep people safe and healthy often are not implemented equitably. An equi equitable implement implementation approach considers racial, economic, and health justice at the levels of agency, strategy, and individual actions. And it centers equity and community voice in all stages of policy implementation. One key aspect of equitable implementation is equitable enforcement or how governments ensure compliance with laws while considering and minimizing harms to underserved communities. Our conversation with our panelists today will focus on implementation of proactive rental inspections, or PRI, a housing code enforcement strategy intended to address some of the equity challenges with traditional forms of housing code enforcement. However, PRI programs themselves must also be carefully tailored and implemented for effectiveness and equity. Before our discussion with our panelists today, I'll give a brief pr presentation of context set and introduce what we mean by equitable enforcement, what the effects of inequitable enforcement are, how housing code enforcement policies, including PRI, can promote health, but also where these, some of these policies may face structural challenges. And finally, I'll introduce some broad principles to support equitable implementation. So what is equitable enforcement? First, it may be instructed to discuss what enforcement is. Enforcement refers to how governments ensure that laws are obeyed and the specific consequences for non-compliance. When we talk about enforcement, we're referring to all forms of enforcement of laws, including administrative, such as imposing fines or rescinding of a license, civil enforcement, such as a civil lawsuit or other action through the court system, criminal, such as a prosecution in a criminal court, and emergency enforcement, which includes the use of government emergency powers to respond to immediate danger. In the public health context, enforcement is commonly used to backstop public health laws and policies. These laws and policies frequently impose obligations on individuals and public or private entities to prevent or mitigate unhealthy or unsafe behaviors, such as violation of food handling standards in restaurants, selling a harmful pr product such as tobacco, and as we'll discuss in more detail today, the failure to maintain safe and habitable rent rental properties. Enforcement of housing laws can be through administrative, civil, criminal, or emergency actions. So equitable enforcement then is a process of ensuring compliance with law and policy, but that also considers and minimizes harms to underserved communities. An equitable enforcement approach means considering equity, both at the level of the public entity's overall enforcement strategy and at the level of individual enforcement actions. It also means considering equity at all stages of enforcement, from determining when to undertake an enforcement action and against whom, to deciding which enforcement tools to use. So while the concept of equitable enforcement is fairly simple in concept, actually achieving it in practice can be quite difficult. Otherwise, well-meaning efforts to enforce laws may result in new health inequities or the exacerbation of existing disparities, otherwise called inequitable enforcement. Two types of inequitable enforcement are commonly observed, over-enforcement and under-enforcement. Over-enforcement occurs when laws are enforced more frequently or more strictly enforced in certain places or against certain people in comparison with others, or also when laws have disproportionate impact on marginalized communities. For example, the racial disparities at every stage of the criminal justice system are caused in large part by inequitable over-enforcement. Black and brown people are far more likely to be arrested, convicted, and sentenced to longer terms at disproportionately higher rates than other groups. 
In the housing context, citations and evictions from nuisance property and crime-free housing ordinances are often disproportionately experienced in black and brown neighborhoods. And even when laws are enforced relatively uniformly across groups, they can still have disproportionate impacts. Uniformity in enforcement alone does not ensure equitable outcomes. Seemingly neutral enforcement provisions tend to have different impacts on the poor than on the wealthy. For example, though enforcement of low-level offenses such as traffic violations by imposing fees is intended to promote safe driving, people who have low incomes are disproportionately impacted by these fees. These fees and fines can affect credit scores, plunge families into debt, result in a loss of a driver's license, or even lead to incarceration. Over enforcement in different areas can also compound inequities. In low income black neighborhoods, residents may experience multiple forms of over enforcement, such as in policing and in housing simultaneously. Conversely, under enforcement occurs when groups experiencing social and economic disadvantages also experience infrequent or inconsistent enforcement of laws designed to protect their health. Laws are only effective insofar as they are backstopped by enforcement. Or harmful be or the harmful behavior is deterred by the threat of enforcement. For example, if there are new laws on the books that are intended to prevent no fault evictions, but are so inconsistently or not even at not even enforced at all, so that there's not a meaningful change in the rates of those evictions, the law is said to be under enforced. As an illustration of under enforcement in the housing context, consider the, these maps of Boston, Massachusetts which has a housing code enforcement system that applies citywide. Though the protections resulting from housing code enforcement are intended to be uniformly distributed across the entire city, unsafe housing conditions and their resulting negative health effects were still significantly more prevalent in neighborhoods with higher proportions of non-white residents, even after adjusting for income and other neighborhood characteristics. In neighborhoods with the fewest white residents, models showed a 17% slower median time until cases involving housing code violations were closed, a 14% higher probability of being flagged as overdue, and a 54% lower prob probability of repair. Inequitable enforcement can also can have significant impacts on community health through pathways such as housing safety and stability, or the ability to stay in housing without being forced to move. For example, Substandard housing conditions such as water leaks, poor ventilation, and pest infestations have been associated with poor health outcomes, most notably those related to asthma. Additionally, people who are chronically unhoused face substantially higher morbidity in terms of both physical and mental health and increased mortality. Housing code and its enforcement is intended to prevent and ameliorate some of these harms. So how do housing codes and their enforcement promote health? Housing codes are intended to promote the safety and habitability of homes and advance the health and welfare of communities. They set the minimum standards for housing conditions that all rental housing must meet to protect the health of residents. These standards include those related to heating, plumbing, hot water requirements, abatement of infestations, and kitchen and bathroom standards. As mentioned earlier, Laws intended to benefit community well-being only work insofar as they are followed, and whether they are followed depends on, in part on how the laws are enforced. Enforcement of these housing codes ensures, to the extent feasible, that all housing in the community is safe and healthy for its residents and neighbors by pr promoting and requiring compliance with the code. Housing code enforcement is traditionally conducted on a complaint basis where a code enforcement officer conducts a housing inspection in response to a resident's complaint about a substandard housing condition. If the complaint is substantiated, then enforcement proceedings such as a fine, an order to remediate, or other action begins. However, despite the aims of housing codes, several structural challenges exist. First, code enforcement has a history of being inequitably used as a tool and a pretext to clear Black neighborhoods and make way for urban renewal. Second, the process for responding to housing code violation complaints allows landlords to put off remediation through extensions and delayed reinspection. Fines may not always be sufficient to deter landlords from allowing conditions in their units to deteriorate. Third, tenants with the greatest needs and the least resources may be less willing or unaware of how to access the system. They may fear retaliation from their landlords. 
and they may be less likely to make complaints and only speak up after problems have reached an advanced state. So without policies and practices that intentionally and institutionally advance equity, code enforcement can exacerbate inequalities, the, the very inequalities is, it is intended to address. Proactive rental inspections, or PRI, is one policy response to the structural challenges of traditional housing code enforcement. PRI, also called systematic or periodic code enforcement, is a systematic model of regular preventative inspections of rental properties. Because PRI programs require inspection on a scheduled basis, they can mitigate some of the issues with complaint-based systems by removing the burden of initiating enforcement. PRI programs do not replace traditional complaint-based inspections. Rather, they are intended to, to supplement them, working to improve overall housing conditions in a locality and allowing more targeted, responsive investigations of violations. However, PRI is not a panacea to the equity issues of housing code enforcement, nor can it guarantee healthy housing alone. No policy can. So even though PRI aims for and generally promotes equitable housing outcomes, it also has structural challenges similar to other housing code enforcement. Over enforcement of PRI can harm tenants, for example, through displacement that often disproportionately affects black, indigenous, and other people of color and people with low incomes. People of color and people with low income are more likely to live in areas with housing stock in poor condition. When code violations are strictly enforced on these properties, tenants may be may end up displaced as a result of landlord retaliation or rent increases intended to cover the cost of repair. Over enforcement of housing codes against landlords of small buildings can also compound other systemic issues like increased institutional investment, gentrification, and foreclosures, all aimed at driving them out of the market. Properties formerly owned by small landlords are often converted to home ownership units or taken over by large property owners that are often less accommodating to tenants and more likely to raise rents. On the other hand, under enforcement of PRI through infrequent inspections and inconsistent enforcement of discovered violations can continue housing related harms that already are disproportionately experienced by Black, Indigenous, people of color, and low income tenants by failing to remedy the unsafe housing conditions. So, in order to counteract some of the challenges and potential inequities that flow from the implementation of PRI and other housing code enforcement programs, localities can enact strategies that involve affected community groups and groups in design, implementation, and administration of PRI programs, change the culture of enforcement away from simply finding violations and enacting punitive measures, and towards improving community health as a goal. It can also promote cooperation with landlords through cooperative compliance strategies, develop cross-sector or interagency coordination partnerships, and mitigate the harm from enforcement. These strategies are not only useful for PRA programs, but can apply universally to all equitable enforcement efforts. If you would like to learn more about PRI programs and equi equitable implementation, please see our resources available on our website. These resources include a comprehensive guide to PRI programs, a model PRI ordinance, a guide to equitable enforcement, among other housing and good governance resources. We will also be releasing a PRI action guide in the spring of 2024, so keep a look, an eye out for that. And with that, let me hand it, hand it over to Heather Wong, an attorney at Change Lab Solutions, who will be moderating today's discussion. Thanks so much, Vince, for that very informative presentation. Um, I'm really excited and thrilled to introduce our panelists that we have for this event. So um, joining us today, we have Ellen Hill, who is the Director of Planning and Urban Develop, uh, the, sorry, Director of the Planning and Urban Development Department for the City of Monroe in Louisiana, um, where she is currently leading efforts to pilot more proactive housing code policies and programs. Um, we also have Jake Deshaw, who is the Deputy Commissioner of Code Enforcement and Zoning Administration for the City of Syracuse, New York, um, where he has helped implement innovative rental registration and proactive inspection laws for many years. Um, and we also have Sunny Hutton, who is a co-founder of Homes for All St. Louis, 
where she organizes tenant unions and advocates for more equitable housing laws that center the needs of tenants and residents. Um, so that is just to share a little bit more about our panelists um, and we'll go ahead and dive into our conversation, but we will have a slide at the end uh, with their contact information. Um, so you're welcome to connect, reach out and connect with them after this event uh, to learn more about uh, the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, great. So with that, to kick us off, uh, I wanted to ask if each of you could share uh, what are one or two of the most pressing housing code related issues in your communities right now. Okay, I, I guess I'll start. <laughs> Um, you know, Monroe's a, a minority, uh, majority minority city. We are a majority renter city. So, you know, having um, a prevalence of rental property in our community lends us to a variety of um, housing related issues, but then also the challenge of how to tackle those without it imp uh, impacting negatively our tenants. And, and of course, we also have, because we have a prevalence of um, rental property, we have the, the constant, um, what would be, could be friction between homeowners and renters, where we do have uh, properties that are not properly maintained. And so they constantly have tenants moving in and out, which causes those who are there as the, as the permanent residents really having to have a um, constant conversation with their neighbors about, you know, what's expected on, on the block that they live in. Um, so those are probably the two big things that we, we constantly are challenged with in, um, in our community. Sure, I guess I can go second. Um, Similar to that, uh, the city of Syracuse is also very uh, heavily rent based for our residential dwelling units. So we're probably really close to a 60% uh, rental uh, percentage um, out of our out of all the dwelling units um, that are citywide. Um, and we're uh, over 50% of our parcels are, are nonprofit. So there's limited tax base with that. Um, and we're an old city, so we have a very, very old aging housing stock. Um, many of these structures have gone through limited uh, investment over many, many, many years. Uh, so, um, and one of the mo most recent things that we've been tackling is a health crisis with some of the highest elevated blood lead levels for uh, lead paint poisoning in children five and under. Um, and, and that's something that we're really working towards getting a, a better handle over. But, um, you know, as we'll get into the rest of, of this webinar um, in the series today is it really has been um, you know, disproportionately against a you know a certain community, and it's 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 something that is you know was a problem long before uh, started as a problem long before many of us were here. But um, it's the environment that we're left with and that we're we're dealing with. So um, a lot of really really important work going into not only uh, healthy housing um, but uh, public health as well. Hi, everyone. I could definitely agree with uh, much of what Ellen and Jake said. Uh, Homes for All St. Louis is a Black renter-led organization. So the reason we even got involved in this work um, and chose to be the ones leading it is because from our own direct experience as renters, um, our own experience with dealing with um, absentee landlords or an unresponsive uh, code enforcement system. Uh, but once we got together, with uh, our different stakeholders, we started to pick apart the code enforcement process and identify where those pain points were. Um, and what we came up with, some of the, I'll just give you two. One was a lack of data. Uh, code enforcement officers would be the ones having to look for the contact information for for the owners or the landlord. So they would be scouring the Secretary of State website or going to buildings to get to see if permits were recently pulled. Uh, and then uh, additionally, I'd say um, some of our enforcement uh, tactics have been uh, disproportionately impacting some 
some of our more impacted communities like our elderly, uh, low income folks and renters. Thank you for thank you all for sharing um, those more about those challenges um, in your work. And I guess, um, you know, just keeping those kinds of challenges in mind. And I wanted to ask a few questions um, relating to the role of cross sector partnerships and addressing um, some of these challenges in housing code um, and enforcement. And I guess I'll maybe start with Sunny. Um, if you could maybe share a little bit more about how Homes for All St. Louis has been thinking about and approaching um, fostering partnerships between tenants and impacted community members and city and county officials, and if there are any particular strategies that you've found uh, really successful in building a culture of trust and collaboration and addressing some power dynamics that might come up. Yeah, thank you, Heather, for that question. I want to make sure that I give you guys some 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 core, some strategies that you can take back to your city. Um, well, first and foremost, foremost, like I said, um, the lead on the project, the project lead is the community based organization of uh, Homes for All St. Louis, a black renter led organization. So that really shook up the dynamics. It, it's not usually led uh, by us. It's usually an effort starting internally with the municipal government. Um, to initiate this process. Um, but instead, we came to them and um, I actually met, did one on ones with each and every person that serves on our committee um, just to let them know about the project, our intentions and uh, to let them know what their role would be, what we expect their role to be. And we even said this. We need this type of person. You, you need a representative from your from your department, your division or your organization to serve. And this is the type of person that we need. It was crucial to us that anyone that was serving on um, our committee had decision making power, had the ability um, and authority to influence, which was important. Um, one thing that we did when we brought all those different folks together, well, let me say this, I didn't know every single stakeholder. So I did have a team around me that if they had a contact or had a pre-existing relationship with a contact, they would be the one to reach out to them via email, via sale, and set up a one-on-one -on -one with them as well to discuss the project. But once we brought all those, uh, stakeholders together, um, and we had to be mindful that it was a div diverse set of stakeholders. We co-created our values. Um, we even created a decision making model, which is consensus. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure that we have the voices of residents on in this committee. So we actually stipend some of our most impacted residents to serve on as code enforcement fellows. So all they have to do, they're just simply existing. Their experience is expertise. Um, so we wanted them to be part of it. So we have low income renters, student renters. We have um, what we call legacy homeowners who have been in their home or their parent passed down their home. And then we have elders who serve on it as well. So we we tried to be mindful of who we were bringing on and we wanted to make sure that the residents are being compensated for their time because they could be doing somewhat something else like working. <laughs> right. Um, and then another thing that we did is that we wanted to make sure that we create opportunities for camaraderie. So we do trainings together. We um, attend the Strategic Code Enforcement Management Academy down in Memphis together. Um, we did that this past year and we plan on doing it next year as well. Um, and we also do social hours. So there's opportunities for us to connect and get to know each other on a on a personal level. And we're not we're not just our jobs. Um, so those are some those are the ways that we try to be mindful of the power dynamics and how we try to bring this kind of really diverse set of stakeholders together and move forward in the same direction. Thank you for sharing that, Penny. And yeah, that point about the compensation is really important too. And um, Ellen uh, or Jake, uh, you know, uh, wondering if you had anything to add uh, to what, or react to what Penny shared um, from the perspective of local government and um, also related to that, curious if um, you've sort of discovered any opportunities to also partner with landlords and community organizations to promote uh, what Vince was already talking about, uh, about the cooperative code compliance incentive supports and particularly for smaller landlords and low income um, homeowners. 
So yeah, I'll um, leave it to you if either of you want to chime in. Um, I'll add that, you know, certainly as we started thinking about how do we get into this space, knowing that the idea has to be compliance and uh, not so much to figure out another way to punish either tenants or punish landlords, property owners, but how do we improve the quality of life in our community? And so with that, you know, we have looked at our American Rescue Plan funds and said, you know, we will look to invest some of that in rental property with landlords that come on board with us to pilot a rental registry. But also the idea would be that, you know, small landlords, a landlord who has only a couple of properties may not have the funds to really, you know, perhaps address some of the issues that even they would want to. So how do we partner with them and their tenants to really identify those priorities in, in those properties that then we can give them small grants to address? So we recognize that we have to take this from a very collaborative standpoint um, and getting, you know, sort of coming in with the, with the honey and carrots and say, let's all try to get on the same page because the idea, um, you know, that really led us, and I'll say from my office standpoint, that we had to do something was when COVID came. And we recognized how families were living in such conditions that, you know, how do we, and then they had no choice, right? They couldn't go anywhere. So how do we start really having a conversation that we can really be uh, of help? You know, my favorite phrase is always, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And people always laugh, but truly that's that's where we started. And so, you know, we've put together a variety of um, ideas that we're going to put forth through our working group to see what our policies and programs actually look like. And we've set aside the money already, you know, just don't know what the numbers will be. Uh, we were fortunate enough to just recently get uh, a lead hazard grant that we know will make a big difference in our community. And so we've got landlords now coming to us with uh, the idea that we want to help and not just condemn their property. That's something that, you know, I didn't even think of that when we started this, that landlords would be concerned that the reason why we want to get in their property is they end up condemning it. and. Um, you know, we've taken the view that, no, we want to preserve as many uh, houses as possible. And so how do we get in there to help before the house really goes beyond the point that you really can't salvage it? Jake, I would love to hear about those community ambassadors. Sure. <clears throat> I wasn't sure if Ellen was done. Um, yeah, so uh, about... This probably started about four or five years ago here, um, you know, 2018, 2019 timeframe. And uh, the city of Syracuse as a whole and the work that we do within our, our Department of Neighborhood and Business Development really saw that there was a gap in services to residents, to specific residents, not because um, that we weren't trying to, but we were missing a connection to certain neighborhoods and certain communities and certain groups. So um we have a community ambassador program now which which partners uh my department with third with a third party um nonprofit um organization that gets us connections and boots on the ground within specific unique neighborhoods to help connect us with people that need our services that traditionally maybe were afraid to contact us or there was a language barrier or they didn't know what types of services that we provide um, but it really started um, uh, boots on the ground and doing these what we called kitchen table talks where we went around to neighborhoods and we sat down and we really uh, experienced and learned the problems that that residents and these are these are renters, most of them, um, what they were facing. Um, and a lot of it was focused on health and safety. Um, uh, really taking a deep look at what our community engagement efforts were with these with these neighborhoods um, and that we really had some poor communications and relations with them, um, not intentionally. We just 
you know, we weren't being bold and intentional on trying to improve that. Um, we uh, found out that there was a, a big need for education and uh, on tenants rights and different um, entitlements and responsibilities as well. On the other side, um, we focused on beautification efforts um, and really just an attitude that the city uh, code enforcement office in particular was going to have a we're going to do with you versus for you. And, um, you know, the city of Syracuse is, is not very large. We're 150,000 uh, population, about 26 uh, square miles. And we have 26 different and unique neighborhoods throughout that all have different needs um, and, and different problems and different challenges. So um, from there, it kind of went to us getting a grant um, to kind of pilot this, where we actually we we pay our community ambassadors to be uh, work in partnership with code enforcement and with neighborhood and business development. Um, but they're really out there representing the residents and the tenants and trying to problem solve and connecting them with us. And what it really has done that I'm most impressed with is it's it's built up accountability on both sides of the table where um you know we do case management meetings with each uh community ambassador uh weekly so we're monitoring what cases they brought to us where we're at what we're doing with them to um, get compliance from landlords in certain situations and then also um you, you know what what they're doing what the tenant's doing um as well uh, so it's it's really just created this avenue and this pathway to uh connect us uh in a I guess, a, a non-traditional type of way where we're officially partnered with this third party organization that never partnered with government to do what they're doing, but really at the at the core of what we both do, we want the same thing. Um, and this organization that we partnered with exists to do just that. They want to improve uh, housing and support our residents. So it, it just made sense. And it we continue to evolve and iterate and try to make improvements to this program. But it, it's pretty unique. Um, and uh, I'm really, really excited to say, you know, five years later, we've come a long way and, and done a lot of really, really good things with the program. Thank you for sharing um, everyone. And yeah, Jake, the community ambassador program seems like a great model. Um, and I also wanted to pick up on what you were saying in there as well about uh, different neighborhoods having different needs and um, having different circumstances. And uh, I guess just, you know, wanting to shift into a little bit more about what code enforcement looks like on the ground. I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the role of discretion um, for code enforcement officers and how do you think about this and what are some strategies for ensuring that code enforcement officers um, have the necessary discretion to respond to respond differently um, to different circumstances while also ensuring that discretion is exercised in an equitable manner. Sure. Um... And before getting into like individual discretion by like on the inspector level or on the individual level, I think our, our groundwork and our framework was really we took a hard look on how how we deploy our uh, code enforcement inspectors and where are they located? What's their territory? What are they responsible for? Um, and it's kind of sad, but I can say here and admit like we we were deployed uh, initially just by equal quadrants, by splitting the city into four, Northwest, Northeast, Southwest, Southeast. And it just didn't make sense. It's like, why are we why are we deploying equal amount of inspectors in these geographic areas that, you know, they're not focused on anything data-based or anything that's actually real that, um, that we can actually look at? Um, so a lot of our deployment is, is evidence-based, right? So we actually took historical data and we looked at not only the data side of things, but we took a hard look at what unique conditions and features existed by na by the neighborhood level. Um, and, and we put our inspection team out there into these. Uh, we created, uh, I guess, regional territories, but then within those regional territories to get even more uh, granular, we created catchment areas, all different geographic sizes um, and specific 
um, inspectors were assigned to those specific areas um, and all of them have different needs. So each inspector has kind of like a unique workload and kind of a different approach to their day-to-day -day style uh, communication. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, we're, we're still enforcing, um, you know, mandatory codes, but each, each neighborhood has different needs and um, we're connecting and working with our community ambassadors in those different neighborhoods around different things and maybe partnering with different agencies, uh, you know, due to different problems. So, you know, a problem in one neighborhood, it might not even be something um, another neighborhood might be happy to have that problem in, in their neighborhood. You know, like, you know, we have some neighborhoods that have really, really, uh, they're historic districts with mansions in them. And some of the problems that they have you know, about leaves blowing from their yard into another yard. It's like, that's such a minute problem. And like, you know, another neighborhood would be happy to say that's the only problem that they have, you know? Um, and so um, each individual territory is really, really looked at as their own um, kind of unique space and, and they're not treated the same. And it changes. We evaluate it about every two years and change those territories and kind of what our framework is and what our goal is. Um, in that area, but we really try to go into it with resources too. Um, for instance, if we have a lot of like owner occupants that are struggling, um, that are on limited income, like we treat those differently than we treat a landlord. We do, um, you know, they're not in it for a business. Um, and how can we connect them to improve, you know, the conditions of their home if they need help? It's not just, you know, here's a ticket, like figure it out, good luck. Um, so, We've armed our inspection team with resources to go out into the field and connect people to other resources um, related to anything. It could be, uh, we even connect people to things like we have a, a financial wellness program, like, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, we, you know, have material and things that we can give out to people to connect them to not just our services, but other city services too. So um, it really starts there on that deployment. And then from there, it gets really uh, down to the personal level by inspector on the discretion on, on you know, how they're going to enforce um, you know, our laws, rules, regulations, and ordinances, but in an equitable manner. And I think they're able to be successful in doing so because, the, you know, they're in a very, very specific territory and we have very specific goals within that. Um, but it's, but it's also evidence-based and it's collaborative. Um, and we're all working towards the same thing. It's just the path that's taken by geographic territory is slightly different depending on the needs and the conditions within. So happy to expand on that or answer questions later on about it. But, um, it's been really, really eye-opening to see the difference from where we were and where we are today uh, using that deployment uh, tactic. Thanks, Jake. That's so helpful, like just building in that into the structure of the itself. And um, Benny and Ellen, I, I just wanted to see if you had any reactions um, to what Jake was saying or, or additional thoughts. And I uh, also wanted to bring in bring in another point that Ellen, you were talking about about you know trying to avoid a condemnation. And, and, you know, one of, you know, some of the harms that come up, uh, tenant displacement comes up in code enforcement. So, yeah, just wanted to also bring that issue into the conversation and see if um, anyone had um, strategies or complementary policies or other approaches they're thinking, uh, you know, specifically to address some of these issues. You know, in in Monroe, you know, when I listen to to Jake speak, because you know we're we're probably we're a city of maybe fifty thousand, but we are very similar to what Jake's dealing with in terms of different neighborhoods and the amount of of renters. And so I love that idea of the ambassadors. We started along that trail um, when we started thinking of what do we do about code enforcement. Um, and the idea that we need to have um, a better relationship with not only our community residents, but truly having people in the neighborhoods. And with that, you know, we have somebody I noticed asked a question about funding. We're an entitlement city, so we get HUD funding. One of the things that HUD allows us to do is neighborhood based uh, support neighborhood-based or community-based organizations. And so we've worked to try and build our capacity to have those organizations so that we can turn around and have a partner like what Jake has. 
you know, and so we've been working at building that while at the same time looking at how do we build our um, our code enforcement effort around the idea of really building community and addressing community issues. And so making sure that as we build capacity in our community, we also wanted to build the capacity of our um, code enforcement officers. So something that we're, we're talking about doing too is uh, training for them to understand the resources in the community you know, both in terms of what we know about through our community development department, but through our community partners. So something that we will be doing this fall is having a series of agencies come in and meet with code enforcement so they can better understand the resources out there um, and, and make sure that they know how they can tap into assistance so that when we do get to, you know, our condemnation, where it is, you know, the property is beyond what could, you know, could be repaired or the repairs are, are going to take so much that the person does have to leave the property. Who else can help them find housing? Where else is there housing? And so, you know, that displacement issue has been a big issue for us, making sure that as we really focus on housing, that we have those answers for those seniors and, and, and folks who are living on fixed income. And then I don't know how many communities are dealing with returning citizens, but we have a good amount of returning citizens who come back sometimes to places that they're trying to rent that are not, you know, um, are, are, are certainly don't meet code. So what do we do about those folks that have to have a place to be to even maintain their freedom. You know, um, that's been a challenge for us. And really just looking at how do we build this rapport with landlords uh, that are, you know, maybe not so good actors, but also how do we, you know, then build capacity with the smaller landlords that do want to do the right thing, just don't have those resources. I don't know if I answered your question. I think I <laughs> went around the bend, but, you know, uh, this is such a, um, in, in some ways, you know, you, you turn the page for one thing and you discover about 10 other things, right? And uh, I hope that by having this conversation, you know, I know I'm taking notes as, Gre as uh, Jake's been speaking. I've been taking notes from Sunny about other things we can incorporate as uh, as we go along, because we're so early in in our journey uh, with this work. Thanks, Ellen. Um, yeah, Sunny, did you also um, have wanted to share any thoughts on uh, any of these topics? We've kind of been quickly now. So Jake, did you want to add anything on that piece about the? Um, Kind of displacement or any of that um, as well. Oh, the question was about tenant displacement. I sorry, I got caught up on all the other ones. <laughs> yeah, um, when we first got started, we said uh, reducing harm um, as a value, um, and then we also ensured that we included tenant representation in our coalition um, because hearing from their direct experience could at least have us aware of it and try our damnedest not to repeat past past mistakes. Um, and then we've also been sitting, um, we just finished up kind of reviewing the code enforcement process and identifying those pain points. And right now we're in the like solution brainstorming part. And, um, and just from those solutions that we brainstormed, we brainstormed supplementary programs and or uh, policies to try to curb um, displacement or to support to offer additional resources to tenants in the case that something like condemnation happens, because sometimes some places are just beyond repair and could truly either they already are or will impact the safety and well-being of the resident. Uh, I was just typing in the chat one of the questions around displacement or 
you know, how maybe a, a proactive code enforcement program kind of does that, does, you know, unintentionally displaces people. So uh, one program we have here that we, uh, again, have sort of piloted, but then put into our budget permanently is a emergency repair program. Um, when there are violations that are discovered that may um, lead to displacement, so things like um, sewer backups or lack of heat or um, leaks and things of that nature, we do have a, a bucket of money set aside to go in. If we can't get the owner to do those timely, we actually have the ability to hire a contractor. They're on a preferred list that we've already RFP'd or RFQ'd for. And uh, it really covers all different areas of work. So we have electricians, we have HVAC contractors, we have general contractors, um, and we can send them in to make those repairs to stabilize. Um, you know, it doesn't mean there might not be other violations, but it stabilizes anything that's considered life safety or anything that's considered to be a type of violation that would displace uh, tenants from living in that dwelling unit or that structure. Um, and how that works is, you know, obviously we have to pay the money up front but uh, we then bill the owner uh, for those services with a surcharge. And if they go unpaid, those get rolled onto their property taxes. So, you know, that can take some time to, to really come into play. But um, and the Tyler kind of uh, court decision has thrown a, a little bit of a wrinkle in foreclosing um, uh, on, on homes. But, um, you know, at, that's the end game is if, you know, uh, especially with landlords, if they are not being responsible that uh, and working with us, um, that at some point in time you could you could lose your home, and we would then put it into our land bank, um, and then either you know maintain those tenants or look for uh, to sell it to somebody else who uh, has the resources and that and the time and effort um, needed to make it a safe, healthy home. So that's just one of the ways uh, that we work on uh around uh preventing d uh displacement of people when we're trying to be proactive in our code enforcement efforts but from a policy or legal standpoint too we've also created things like within our rental registry program for one and two family rentals um we put a provision in there on collection of rent where um it's it's it specifically states like a, a landlord can't collect rent when they don't have a valid rental registry certificate now we're not out there actually stopping rent payments um, between tenants and but it's really a, an eviction uh, prevention tool and our court systems are now asking when it when a landlord is in front of a judge at eviction court they look and they verify do you have a valid rental registry certificate and if they don't that case is thrown out and it's dismissed and they'll see the violation report if there is one and have that and so um, that is sort of helping too um, it, it's preventing landlords from just you know, throwing tenants out um, um, uh, when they when they have violations, when they have code enforcement pro problems and they're not on our uh, compliance list for um, having a valid rental registry certificate. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, those sound like uh, very powerful tools for sure. And um, I guess I wanted to Maybe I'll open up a question to all the panelists, um, just moving to a little bit more about equitable implementation and um, the piece around evaluation of um, policies and, and uh, kind of ongoing uh, kind of, like you mentioned, an iterative process to ensure that the policies are not creating unintended consequences or inequities. Um, and I guess, you know, if, uh, any of you want to chime in on this um, as to, you know, what are some metrics or what are some processes that uh, you feel like would be really helpful in this space um, or that you've had success with uh, in the past? So this window for us has kind of come to a close, but it's a good example on how to continue to think about how the environment and the things happening in your community or in your world are changing and how to try to adjust to it. Um, with COVID, there was a lot of issues with uh, with rent payments and collection of rents. Um, so a lot of money was put uh, to multiple different levels of government, um, uh, county level here uh, in, in Syracuse, but also to our city. But um, there was a lot of funding available on 
rent relief. But what we were able to leverage with that and to come up with is that we weren't going to give a landlord um, months and months of, of, of rent relief payments if they were had outstanding code violations or if they had uh, overdue rental, you know, if they weren't compliant with the rental registry. Um, so we would tell them, yeah, you're eligible. We, we would give this to you, but um, you need to get a rental registry. You uh, people were, they would drive down to our office or apply and pay and try to get an appointment like the same day. Um, and that was really a, a big tool to leverage that, um, you know, obviously those funds are, are, are all uh, dispersed by now, but it, it was really able to get us in a lot of structures and to deal with a lot of problems that uh, maybe we wouldn't have been successful with right away. So it's just always continue to think about, you know, what are the kind of different driving factors and things happening uh, in your city and your, you know, in your, in your municipality that, you um, you can leverage but so we're always thinking how we can't stay the same like we need to adjust constantly and um if you do that i think you'll come up with better better policy better programs and kind of it's hard to do but stay ahead of the game i guess Thanks, Jake. Um, yeah, Sunny, I'm curious if this has come up in your work too, um, as far as, you know, advocating for policies and then thinking about the implementation piece and evaluation, um, if, if this is something that has come up and how you're thinking about it. Um, but I also know we have a lot of audience questions too, so I can also certainly move us um, to that as well. Or Ellen, if you wanted to chime in on this, um, or, or we can... Uh, see, see what's going on. Let's see what's going on in the chat. I see about 12 questions. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's uh, let's dive in. So, um, yeah, I know Greg and Vince are monitoring it and they've highlighted a few. Um, so I think this one is for Jake. Uh, what have you all done? Uh, what have you all done to successfully partner with landlords and responsible parties that have substandard conditions from a code enforcement standpoint? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, uh, I've found uh, personally here in my work that a lot of landlords that have housing conditions like that aren't necessarily willing and able to come to the table. Not all of them, but it's I found it to be rare, and I'm going to throw out the term slumlord, um, but a lot of uh, owners that we found that have a, like really, really problematic and substandard housing, and I'm not just talking like one location, I'm talking multiple buildings, multiple dwelling units throughout the city, is sometimes uh, we've just had to take a, the stick approach with those types of landlords where we're really, really coming after them uh, with all the tools and resources that we have from a legal standpoint. Um, <clears throat> it's obviously not our number one option that we would like to take, but um, that's what I've seen is that a lot of um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of housing that we find like that isn't necessarily a landlord who's communicating with us. It's usually an LLC. And we're not even sure like who's behind it sometimes. And their property manager is changing every three months. We can never pin down like, who it is and you talk to the tenants and they're like, I don't know, I give somebody money every month, they come and just collect it. And it's, you know, it can be hard to kind of chase down, but we found that a lot of, uh, a lot of the worst properties that we have are really uh, situations like that, where it's not somebody that's local, they're not communicating and willing to work with us and come to the table. It's they're usually um, they they get they get us a home cheap and they suck every resource out of it without putting anything into it and in turn we have to come back uh, aggressively with our legal tools unfortunately in those situations so I guess to answer I haven't really had a lot of success with dealing with landlords that have really really poor uh, rental units or, or houses because they're usually not the ones that want to come to the table to work with us Yeah, this definitely is a challenge and um, we've seen it come up in our work as well. And um, I, there's another question in the chat, which is for Sunny and Jake. Um, so one of the biggest 
challenges in achieving code enforcement compliance in LA has been the cultural perspectives and practices of our pool of inspectors. Often inspectors are not from the communities they are inspecting, see themselves specifically and solely as enforcers of code and do not feel their role in the inspection process should intersect with the residents living on site. I'm curious if any of the panelists um, have experience and feedback about efforts and partnering with code enforcement teams, shifting the culture so that inspectors understand the benefit to collaborating and partnering with res residents and landlords and proactively work towards ensuring healthy housing is achieved expeditiously and innovatively. And I, I know, Jacob, you kind of touched on this as well with the Community Ambassadors Program, but um, yeah, if you want to share more about that or Sunny and Ellen as well, um, feel free to share your perspective. Sure. I, um, beyond the Community Ambassador Program, I think some of the things that we do is um, we have a residency requirement. So you have to live in the in the city of Syracuse to work here. Um, it can be challenging sometimes when filling certain positions, but um, we've also worked very intentionally with our county partners who actually oversee um, the civil service side of our, our job uh positions and we've changed some of the minimum requirements and kind of changed who we're looking for um, in these roles. Um, but we've been very intentional to find an interview and recruit people um, that are that are from here and have a unique and diverse background. So um, easier said than done sometimes working if you're in a union kind of civil service sort of shop. Um, but um, it is possible to do, and we have done that. And I would say over the last handful of years, we've been able to bring on um, a very, very diverse uh, group of uh, inspectors. And, and then beyond that, once we get them hired, it's we really have the ability now to say, okay, what neighborhood should we put this particular inspector in? What are their you know, what What are they really good at? What, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What neighborhood do they live in? What's their background? Do they speak multiple languages? Um, you, you know, so we then get really granular on the actual placement of uh, once we hire somebody that's a good fit overall for our department is then even look at even more uh, details about them on how and where we're going to place them, um, you know, for their for their job. Well, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Sunny. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I just wanted to share a recent experience. Um, we, for the folks, the inspectors that served on our coalition, um, they actually brought this up. They they mentioned how they come into, you know, they inspect the property and they see that there's a need, a greater need than what their role can provide. Um, so we actually did a did a little a walkthrough. Our organization was side by side with the buildings and Department of Health inspectors to do uh, an inspection and walkthrough of a property owned by one of the corporate giants. They own multiple properties and many of them are in similar conditions. Um, and we we were able to go through those properties and there was I just remember the problem properties officer just like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I don't know what to do or give to these people when they when this and this is happening. There's so many problems that they're experiencing. Can you help? And so he took my card and he provides, you know, he shares the card with them and with his other officers when they go to some of these properties. And for us in that moment, um, being able to connect with the residents, they felt a sense of like familiarity and safety with us. Um, and they were more open to sharing what was going on in their home and what they needed. And we were able to connect them with the resources that they needed um, and keep them abreast of how the code enforcement process works. So we did see for us, we felt a change and a shift. Um, but I think that shift is also going to have to take place. That was just a one time thing. That shift is also going to have to take place, become embedded in the practices of our code enforcement department um, to ensure that there's collaboration with community organizations and that uh, and that those inspectors have on hand direct resources that they can give and provide to to tenants. Thank you for sharing that. Ellen, did you also want to uh, chime in on this 
you're, I think you're, oh, sorry. I think you're muted. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I just also want to add that, you know, when I took over code enforcement, when I took over my department, the one thing I, I just said to staff was, you know, today is a new day. Our goal isn't, you know, enforcement in terms of just making sure we're checking that box. Our goal is to improve the quality of life of our residents. And so with that, you know, our I, I would meet with them on a regular basis, the code enforcement officers, and talk about what are we really seeing and how do we begin to address that issue. So looking at the property owners, you know, we we looking at property owners as potential partners instead of looking as tenants as violators. You know, we used to drag tenants to the to the um, environmental court, and instead of telling the property owners, "Hey, you know, this is your property. You know, what do we do to ensure that you know you're meeting the codes?" Because a lot of times the tenants would come and say, "Well, I can't fix it," or you know, my landlord won't let me touch this, or you know, I've complained to my landlord. Um, so the idea was, how do we begin to talk with landlords about the issues and really looking at it from the standpoint of, we really want you to comply. We want to make sure that, you know, we don't end up condemning your property, displacing your tenants. You know, we recognize that it's a business for you. So why aren't you investing in your business? and uh, looking for ways to connect them with other resources. So with that, you know, we advocated with the state to our housing agency in the state, and they actually listened and created a small landlord program where they've simplified the rules and put out funding for uh, small landlords to secure funds. And I consider that a win from our conversations that we started having locally in our community about the rental properties and how do we ensure that the properties come up to code rather than us just condemning properties, tearing it down. And then we have vacant properties and we haven't addressed our housing issue. Um, you know, so from that standpoint, I, I considered a different approach in terms of making sure that we look for resources uh, to help, but also making sure the code enforcement officers understand that their job is to help and not just, you know, write, uh, write summons, you know, give someone um, the, the, the opportunity to figure out how do we address this without it being viewed as something punitive. And I think the culture change in the office went a long way of changing the way um, we've done business. And, it, and it's impacted, uh, I think, our relationship with the community, mm -hmm. and it's impacted the relationship we have with landlords. I think we're actually getting much more compliance now with uh, issues than uh, before. Thanks, Ellen. Um, I think we'll. Have, I think I'll throw one more question from the audience um, chat. Um, but just a reminder: you feel uh, we will uh, be sharing contact information at the end of this presentation. So please feel free to reach out to Change Up and our panelists um, to follow up with any other questions. Um, but there's been. It seems like there's a lot of interest in some of these resources you all have been talking about connecting. Uh, landlords, homeowners with resources to make uh, habitability repairs. Um, so, yeah, if any of you could maybe share more about um, how how do you kind of grow those resources that are out there and connect people and, you know, make sure that they're actually sufficient to be able to help address some of these, um, some of these issues. Um, well, for us, I mean, I always hope and wish our we had a bigger fund uh, pool, but um, you know we've started a lot of the initiatives and programs we have with with pilot programs, um, limited dollar amounts with uh, you know with grant dollars typically, um, and 
when successful, we were able to champion those before our council to get them into our budget permanently. Uh, and that's what we're doing with our community ambassador program. That's what we've done with our emergency repair uh, program too. Um, so it's kind of, you know, show some success, get, get a champion, um, and then, you know, get it into your budget is really the formula that we found and easier said than done. Right. Um, I've been fortunate to have very, very strong, passionate leadership, uh, with our mayor, uh, council set up here on both sides of the table. So it wasn't as hard as it, you know, for me, as it might be for some of you, but, um, that's just one way to maybe look into it. So uh, another way I would say, and, and this is, uh, comes from my community development days, but, uh, looking at local banks, um to look at their uh community reinvestment um you know uh activities and having them actually look to pursue funds through the banking system to get grants to address some of these issues so you know something that uh we've looked into is uh local banks actually applying to uh secure funds to address uh, rental property issues, but then also um, properties for uh, low-income seniors specifically, you know, and certainly, you know, after disasters, some of those banks also can go to um, their federal home loan bank that they belong to to secure funding. And that's something that we um, we look to find out about. <laughs> Uh, as uh, as a local government, and then reach out to those banks to ask, are they applying for funding? Because we have potential, um, you know, potential customers. Because the way they look at it as well, you know, if they give someone a grant, that person might be uh, more likely to think of uh, them to do business with as well. And that goes for those landlords. Um, uh, as well. So that's an area that, you know, we've sought to find those uh, additional funds. And the same thing goes with the other areas, you know, looking at nonprofits to see where we can um, educate them about pursuing funding to address some of these issues so that it's not just the local government figuring out ways how to uh, address them. So we've hosted grant writing workshops, you know, that we use our limited uh, community development block grant funds to educate those organizations for them to then pursue funding that either we couldn't or we didn't have the capacity uh, to pursue to address some of the housing issues that we're encountering. And by doing that, it certainly, you know, has helped to expand the resources available in our community. Thank you, Ellen. Um, well, given the time, I am, I am gonna uh, wrap this up. I know we could keep talking for a long time, um, but thank you so much uh, to all of you for sharing these uh, really valuable experiences and ideas and strategies and models. And um, I'm gonna uh, just pass it to Vince to, uh, to close us out. Um, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, thanks again, Heather. And that's all we have time for today. But I want to give a big thank you to Sunny, Ellen, and Jake for sharing your thoughts and insights. And thank you, everyone else, for tuning to the discussion and for your thoughtful questions. Before we close, we um, I'd like to note that we'll be posting a link to this recording along with a summary of this conversation and any key resources that we've mentioned on our website at changelabsolutions.org. And as Shaniqua noted earlier, we'll hope you, we hope that you'll join us for upcoming sessions in our equity in action series. So up next, we have a wonderful panel lined up to talk about tenants right to counsel. And we'll be sharing more information and the registration link through our email newsletter on our website and through social media. And, and finally, let's stay connected. So if you'd like to follow up or learn more about anything that we discussed today, please feel free to reach out. Uh, our contact information is here on this page. And once again, I want to thank you for joining us today. And another big thank you to our panelists for their insights.